to another flying video at flight level 180. Today we are flying the V35B Bonanza from Rep in Carinado. And let me jump into the cockpit and get things going. So this is the Rep version of the Carinado V35B. And I hope you saw my video about the about the straight up V35B from Carinado. This is uh, this version is an overlay where the Reality Expansion Pack people have actually taken and done quote fixes and improvements to the airplane to make it more realistic. And it's overall an impressive airplane. They've done a lot of good things. There's a lot of things that need to be fixed and maybe perhaps aren't fixable and we're gonna talk about those in depth. Uh, as you can see, if you look at my tack, I have 157 hours on this, on this, on this airplane, and most of that is, you know, that's not a lot of long haul flights. That's, uh, you know, flying around the pattern and practicing IFR and such. And I, that's probably actually small. I probably have closer to 250 because, you know, one strange thing with this, with this airplane is I left it idling on on the tarmac at, you know. Uh, 1000 RPM lean a peak and I came back 20 minutes later and the engine had completely failed and all my cylinder uh, compressions were zero I needed to replace the engine uh, so which reset the tack which is very strange uh, there's some some strange things that happen with it from time to time but so I'm closer to 250 on the simulator version in the real world uh, I have some time in the right seat of Bonanza's uh, not a massive amount, but a pretty good amount, and I have a pretty good sense of the V35B and what it can do in the real world and what's typical and what's not. So I think I'm pretty qualified to do this in-depth review. Now, let's look at the outside of the airplane. You know, I, I'm not really a guy to, to really get all hot and bothered about how an airplane looks and the cosmetics. You know, I, I'm less interested in the game aspects and more interested in, you know, reality. Like, how close is this to the real thing? Can I go and practice in this airplane and get something that approximates reality? And do the systems and engine and such for do what I'm going to expect when I'm actually in the real airplane? And obviously, since I spend, spend time in V-35Bs, this really hits close to home with this airplane. So, uh, this review is not about you know, it's not about, uh, you know, the cosmetics and how the instruments look and such forth. Though, you know, the cosmetics are great. The instruments are spot on with reality. So, you know, let's, uh, so, so let's focus on the nitty gritty of what the airplane does well and what it doesn't do well. So let's go ahead and I prepared some slides to talk about everything. So let's go ahead and jump right into those. And I'm going to put the airplane on autopilot so I can talk without thinking and we're going to get up to 3500 feet and cruise along nicely and let's go direct enter and then we're going to hit nav and that should get us where we need to go so let's go ahead and look at the slides here so So the first thing, let's, let's start with what's really good about this airplane. Uh, first of all, the engine operating concepts are excellent. Uh, it really explains to you some of the most critical things to understand about operating a high performance fuel injected engine. Uh, so in, that's called rich a peak and lean a peak. And I'm going to show you here, if you can see the EGT gauge in the bottom center of the screen. I have my mixture control. You can see down there, it's all the way in, so I'm full rich right now. And I'm gonna start pulling it back. So watch this. Watch what happens. As I pull back, my EGT, my exhaust gas temperature is gonna rise. And you notice here, it's going up, going up, going up, going up, going up, going up. And then watch what happens. It's gonna hit right about there. It's gonna peak. Now it stops. Now watch what happens it's going to start falling back down. So that maximum EGT is the maximum exa exhaust gas temperature, and that's called peak EGT. And that's a super important number when it comes to deciding how to operate your engine. And 
So where I am now, I'm actually lean of that peak EGT. So my mixture, my fuel flow is below that peak EGT. And if I were to go more fuel, it would be rich of PGT, peak EGT. And I apologize to those of you who know this concept, but it's a very important concept. Operating this airplane, if you look up in the top left corner, you'll see, you can see that negative, you know, negative 300, negative 200. That's the degrees rich and lean a peak I am. As you notice, as I go up, it's gonna go positive. And now I'm rich a peak. So it tells you very explicitly where you are and really helps you to understand. And you can sit there and watch the power. As I go leaner and leaner, my power goes down. And as I go richer, my power goes up and then goes down. So it's a great, great thing to be able to watch that, watch that setting and be able to tune your engine and get it, uh, understand how the, the trade-offs are. It's really wonderful and I strongly recommend it to anybody that they pick up the rep package, to anybody that seriously wants to learn about how to operate engines in a sophisticated manner. And you know, this goes for real world pilots. A lot of people don't understand the red box. They don't understand Richard Peak. They don't understand Lena Peak. They've been told something by their by their uh, by their CFIs that you know may not be correct. And CFIs, many of them don't understand this. And this is somewhat new concepts because Lena Peak operation hasn't been really easy to do until the recent past. I'm not gonna go into that, but uh, it's, it's, it's pretty important stuff to know. So we're going to hit some mountains here if I don't change my course. So let's go ahead and do that. And be a bit of a bummer to auger into a hill here. Uh, so we're now on heading mode. Okay, so let's continue going. So the red box, and you'll see here, so watch what happens. I'm going to take and I'm going to move. I'm now about 50 lean a peak. I can move up to about 20 degrees rich a peak. And watch what it says in the upper left corner. The engine is inside the red box. Reduce power, lean further to extend engine life. Which is correct. You don't, depending on the, the power levels you're running, you want to be either very lean or very rich and you don't want to be in the middle because that puts massive pressure on the engine it moves the peak compression point of the pistons very close to the to where the piston is at the top of the compression stroke when there's no actual movement down and that puts massive pressure on the engine it beats up the engine and it increases temperatures and uh, and it looks like I need to go a little leaner. And, and so it's very important that you stay out of that red box. And, you know, a lot of pilots don't know about that. So it's a great, great tool to, to actually use this, uh, use this rep package because it explains that to you. It explains it in the manual. It's not super in-depth, but it's pretty good. And it helps a lot. So huge, huge advantage to owning this, uh, this rep add-on. Uh, second. The fuel flow, so let's look down at the bottom of the screen, and you can see there my gallons per hour is 13.1, when I'm about 50 rich a peak at, you know, at pretty high power. Now that's pretty, uh, that's pretty accurate, you know, that's pretty impressive, because in my experience in the real world, that's pretty much right on. Now, before I forget it, let me tell you, I'm not a CFI, I'm not giving you real world flight instruction. Uh, if you find this information useful or interesting, you should go and do your own reading and go and talk to your own CFI. This is not real world advice, so don't take it as such. But, you know, hopefully you'll learn something and maybe it'll make you think about what you can do in the real world. But don't use what I tell you. Now, let's go ahead and keep moving forward. So, continuing the good stuff. So, the recommendations in flight are very good. I mean, it gives you a pretty good... Uh, pretty good advice on do this, do this, change this, change that. And it's really very, very good advice, especially when it comes to engine operation. It's, it's nice. Now, the sounds are excellent. The, you know, one, one of the things, the engine sound sounds very good. This is pretty much right on. You can tell they sampled from a real airplane. And the, when you look at the, uh, when you look at the, for example, one thing I find very impressive is when you turn on the fuel flow, 
when you turn on the fuel pump, the auxiliary fuel pump, when you're first priming the engine, it's amazing how accurate that is. That sounds exactly what it sounds like in the Bonanza. It's just right on. And the rate and way the, the needle, the fuel flow needle moves is just right on. It's really impressive. And so, you know, another thing they got right. Uh, the performance. The performance is pretty close to reality. If you see my Carinato V35B, uh, V35B uh, video, I was not impressed with the performance of that airplane. Uh, it's just way too powerful. And this one, compared to a normally aspirated Bonanza, is pretty close to right on. You know, what the air speeds you see and the climb rates you see and what it feels like when you're landing the airplane and maneuvering the airplane are pretty close. It's pretty impressive. Uh, the last thing I really like about this airplane is the... Uh, the updates. The updates have been very good. They issue them every few months and they're pretty close to smack dab right on the money of fixing the, the major issues that need to be fixed. Uh, and I really appreciate that when a developer actually you know spends the time after they've sold an airplane and they actually get it working and fix things. So very nice feature, very nice thing. Now let's talk about the bad, and you know, I love this airplane, but I wanna be honest about what, uh, what is bad about this airplane. So there's a lot of limitations that you see come through from Carinato. And the Carinato airplane, there's just a lot of little details, and I'm not even gonna cover them all, I'm just gonna cover the most egregious ones, but there's a lot of stupid little things that just don't quite work right. And the rep guys either didn't notice them or weren't able to fix them, and it's a bit annoying. Uh, the next thing is, and this is just an example of little details that don't quite work right in this airplane, is the when you are on the ground and you've got the you start the airplane, you've got it in low idle. The first thing you're, you really want to do is you want to go ahead and lean out the airplane to a very to almost to the point where the engine's going to die and it doesn't react normally in this airplane. It, it just doesn't really have any effect until you suddenly hit the point where the airplane just dies because it's starved of fuel. So you should see a little bit of roughness. You should see an increase of RPM as you get to best power. You know, there's a best power setting even when you're at low idle. And you just don't see that. You actually do see that in the F-33A uh, rep package, so kudos to you guys for doing that one correctly, but in the V35B, it's just it just doesn't work correctly. Uh, next thing, the brakes and ground handling are just just putrid in this airplane. The, uh, you can actually, it's, it's almost impossible to stop the airplane. It's just, just not good. It's, uh, even when you lift the flaps completely, it's just, just the brakes are horrible. And if you have that in real life, uh, you go straight to the shop. So that's disappointing. Uh, another thing, and let me show you, uh, let me show you this. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, I'm going to go ahead and drop the gear. And gear is down. I'm going to go ahead and try to get the airplane down to stall speed. So here we go. We're staying nice and level. And this is something that's very important. You want the, you want the stall horn and the stall speeds to be correct. And the stall speeds are too high in this airplane, in my opinion. And second, the stall horn does not work. So, you know, when you're approaching the airport and, you know, you're right on the, the bleeding edge and you're about to stall, you want that damn stall horn to go off. And it just does not work correctly in this airplane. It's, uh, it doesn't work. And I found in V35Bs that stall horn is incredibly sensitive. So let's see if we can get our speed down a little bit. There we go. We're pretty close to stall. And there we go. And, you know, there's, there's no horn there. And it's the only, uh, it's the only, uh, only airplane an X-Plane that I've seen is this Bonanza in the F-33A that has that problem. And it's, uh, it's not great. It's not a great thing. So, uh, you know, that's something that needs to be fixed. And I think they just missed. So anyway, so uh, let's see. We're at 2,500 feet. Let's get up to 3,500 so we can do a little bit more testing. Uh, 
let's go up. Let's just go up a little bit. Okay, and there we go. And let's go ahead and hit heading again. Uh, here we go. So, so, so some other things that are just annoying. Now, let me show you the gear speed here. And we don't have a lot of altitude to do this, but watch this. So I'm going to go ahead and drop my gear. So I, actually, let's go ahead and climb up. I have my gear up, so my gear down. So I'm going to put them up. And let's see what we can do here. So we're going to get a little bit of altitude and we're going to trim for level flight. And there we go. So now we are, we need some more speed here before I can show you this. Let me come back to this in a second once we're uh, leveled off. Uh, so another thing. So watch this. So look at my, look at the bearing pointer here over on the left. Uh, see how it's pointed about 22, uh, 220 degrees. Now, now watch this. I'm going to go ahead and hit the CDI button on the GPS and look what happens. It swings over to almost 3350. That is not a digital gauge, ladies and gentlemen. That is a, that is a physical gauge. So it just looks ridiculous to have you know, a physical gauge flip-flopping based on what setting I'm in. This is not Aspen. This is a physical gauge in this airplane. So it just, just is a little bit silly. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, the altitude effects. There are altitude effects in the rep package. So if you climb up to 15,000 feet and you stay there for an extended period, it, uh, it takes and... Uh, it will start giving you a little bit blurry vision and then it'll eventually you'll lose control of the airplane which is nice in theory but I found that it just doesn't work well uh, let's see let's go ahead and level off here so it just does not work well first of all the altitude effects are too extreme you know I've, I've flown up for extended periods of 12,500 feet and it's uh, you don't you don't start losing consciousness in you know in 20 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever they ever they have it sent set at you know if you're in a horrible shape and you know you have breathing issues maybe that's possible but it's just way overdone so i never fly this airplane over 9500 feet and you know that's a big limitation of this airplane you know it you should be able to i think the the service ceiling is around 18,000 feet for a normally aspirated bonanza and you probably can get higher. And you know, that's just ridiculous that just the limitations of the oxygen of the uh, altitude effects prevent you from going up into higher altitudes. Uh, very disappointing. And so you can, in theory, turn off the altitude effects, but I found that you, you, know, you can turn off some of them, but some of them don't turn off. And you know, other things that are not great is you'll start getting some altitude effects and then you descend, you think, okay, that would take care of the altitude effects, but they stay. So it's not great, it's really poorly done. And I think there should be a way, like some airplanes you see out there, like the DA-62, I think it's just flight perhaps, uh, that you can actually put on your oxygen mask. And you know, every v Bonanza I've ever been in has oxygen on it. You know, a V-35B is gonna have oxygen on board why can't you just wear oxygen and expand the full envelope of the airplane? So very, very disappointing in it. Either the altitude effects need to be removed or they need to add oxygen or they need to fix it because it's just, just not great. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at the, let's go ahead and look at the landing gear issue I was talking to you about. So let's see, so we can go ahead and land our gear. We're inside our speed range. So now watch what happens. So I was at level flight. And watch what happens. I'm just going to release the yoke here. Right? That is, that is not great. I'm going down 3,000 feet per minute. And let's make sure I don't overspeed. But that is, that is really not great. That one of the huge advantages of the Bonanza is that you can actually drop the gear and get 500 feet per minute of descent 
just from the, and, and it's pretty much spot on. You drop the gear, you go down 500 feet per minute once you stabilize. And this airplane, it just absolutely slams the nose down and there's no stabilization at all at 500 feet per minute. So another thing that's just, this really needs to be fixed. And I don't know if it's fixable, it's probably a Carinado issue, but it, it needs to be fixed. Uh, okay, so something here, I don't know if I have the sound turned down a bit, but the sound effects are too loud for this airplane. Uh, and so, so it's almost painfully loud. And so you actually have to go into the, the X-Plane 11 control panel and turn the volume down. Well, that's all well and good and you can do that. But the problem with that is if I switch airplanes, the sound is now too quiet on the airplane that has it correct. And it's, uh, it's a bit of a bummer. Now, some airplanes, I believe the Just Light does this, is you can go and plug in a noise counseling headset in the sim and it reduces the sound. Well, that's not an option here and it's sorely missed and it needs to be, it probably needs to be addressed. Uh, another thing, and this is something that has to do with, uh, with performance of the airplane. The CHT is a bit wonky. So cylinder head temperature is affected by the speed of air over the cylinders, the outside air temperature, the power of the engine, uh, the amount of airflow through the engine from the cowl flask being open and such forth. This airplane does not do a great job of handling that. And let me, uh, it's okay, we're up to 3600, so that's good. Maybe we should drop down a little bit. And 3500 feet. I don't want to be in the clouds and we can avoid it. So, uh, so the CHT effects are very strange and I'm not going to go into detail on that, but when you start going down at, uh, you start going down at, you know, a thousand feet per minute, your CHT should drop pretty drastically and it just doesn't work correctly. So, uh, that's a little disappointing. Uh, and another last thing on the, before I get to the, my biggest gripe about this airplane is the ball is on the left, upper left side of the instrument panel. And you can see that ball is not centered. I have never been in a, in a Bonanza where the ball, where the rigging is so out of, out of, out of true that the ball is not centered. It's just, you know, it's first thing you do is if you go in there and your ball is way over to the left, just from standard cruise, you take it to the shop and say, fix the rigging. And, you know, both the F-33A and the V-35B for, uh, for this company, they are not centered and it's, it's not great. It's really not, uh, it, not well done. It needs to be fixed. So let's get to the last big issue. And I don't mean to carp too much about this airplane, but you know, I want an honest review that really goes into, this is about reality. Well, the things that are not reality need to be fixed. They need to be about reality if, uh, for, uh, for this to be truly a reality expansion pack. So let's talk about Oversquare. So what is Oversquare? So let me show you the manifold pressure gauge and the RPM here. And the, so right now I am, let me move this back a little bit. So I am square right now. So I'm 26 inches of manifold pressure and 26 2600 RPM. So 2626, that's square operations. To be under square, that means the RPM is greater than the manifold pressure. And to be under square, that means the RPM is less than the manifold pressure. So a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of CFIs will tell you that never operate over square. So having, in other words, the RPM under, underneath the manifold pressure. And that is really an old timers thing and it's you'll hear a lot of people say that it's amazing how many people have misconceptions about that but it is not true and especially when you're talking about lean a peak operations and so if you can operate you know if if i were in a real world situation right now in this airplane and i weren't in the rep package i would be operating my airplane at say 2100 RPM and 26 inches of manifold pressure and lean a peak. And that would be perfectly acceptable. But looks what happens when I do that in the rep package. 
wait a few seconds, look in the upper left corner, you're operating the engine above the map RPM limits, reduce the map or increase the RPMs. To know the, the limits, blah, 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 blah. So that's, uh, that's just wrong, okay? And it's, it's pretty sad that they don't have that right because you know it's, it doesn't really reflect, reflect reality. Now let's talk about the benefits of over square operation. The first one is obviously reduced cockpit noise. When I'm at 2100 RPM, it's a lot quieter in the cockpit and my noise canceling ha headsets uh, deal with the noise a lot better. Second, and maybe most importantly, is there's far less friction. When you have a prop turning in a drive shaft turning at 2600, 2700 RPM, there's a lot of friction where if you crank down the 2100 RPM, it's, uh, it reduces that friction a lot. Additionally, you get a lot more horsepower. So you get about, from dropping to 26 to 21, you're going to get about a 10% horsepower gain, which is a lot when you run at that over square setting as long as, you're, uh, as long as you're running with a high enough map. So when you drop the RPM, the fuel flow decreases, which decreases your horsepower. But if you need to move the map to, to adjust for that. So I'm sorry, it's a little complex. I don't really want to go into huge details, but there's huge horsepower advantages. The next thing, there's bit better volumetric efficiency. So air movement is a lot better. The fuel pumps work a lot better when you're operating over square. Uh, you have better prop efficiency. The slower your prop goes, the more efficient the prop is. And that's because you're not creating a lot of uh, high pressure points at the tip of the props as you get closer and closer to the speed of sound. Uh, you aren't doing that, so it's a lot more efficient. You have slower in, and the last thing, and this is a little complicated, but I'll try to take a stab at it. Slower engine rotation allows the combustion event to a longer time to put pressure on the piston. So when the piston is being pushed down by the explosion of the fuel air mixture, until the you, you want to keep that pressure in the piston as long as you can until, until, the, uh, until you open the exhaust valve. So the longer you can keep that exhaust valve closed when there's pressure in there, the more efficient your engine is and the better, uh, the better efficiency you have. So by slowing down the RPM, it slows down the operation of the engine and it keeps those exhaust valves closed a little bit longer. So a lot of huge benefits to Oversquare. Now, the negatives of Oversquare are that it moves the peak pressure point in your in your oper in the engine cycle to much closer to top dead center. So if you think about a four-stroke cycle, the piston comes up, compresses the fuel air mixture, and then the spark fires. And when the spark fires, it takes, there's an explosion in the cylinder, and then the cylinder is almost to the top of the, of the stroke. When it gets up to the top of the piston, it starts coming back down, and then you want, to, you want that pressure to come back down. So you don't want the explosion to happen too early because the piston is up near the top or still going up. You want it to be delayed a little bit. So the oversquare operation moves, since it's slowed down the piston speed, because you slow down the engine, the uh, let me let me start moving south here a little bit. So when you move that uh, when you slow down that engine speed, it moves the the pressure point to top dead closer to top dead center. Now, if you look at this this and so that's really the one of the reasons why people don't want you operating over square because they don't want you to move that peak pressure point too close to the top of the uh, of this of the cycle now the piston stroke now look here this chart here is from the uh, io 520b operating manual so this is direct from continental this is the official manual and you can see there that this they give you a recommend recommended cruise range now look there you can see that the top yellow dot is 24 and a half inches at 2200 RPM and so that's two and a half inches over square and the next one down is 23 and a half at 2000 RPM that's three and a half inches over square and the next one is three and a half inches over square clearly Continental thinks it's fine to run over square but not that extremely over square now the tricky thing about this 
is these charts in the operating manual are for best power. And that's a subtlety that a lot of people don't catch. So this is for 80 rich a peak. And so these charts, so they're saying if you're at 80 rich a peak, which is already a high pressure, it's very, very close to top dead center where the, uh, where the peak pressure point is, by moving lean a peak to say 50 or 100 lean a peak, you move that peak pressure point much, much later. So that counteracts the, 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 Destination ASOS is my, uh, obviously I'm getting close to my airport here. By moving, by moving lean a peak, you move your peak pressure point later. And when you, uh, you operate over square, you bring it back. So you can counteract a lot of the negative impact on the peak pressure point from over square by going lean a peak. So this chart is just not correct at all for lean a peak operations. So if I were flying in a real world airplane and I, were, I had 26 inches of manifold pressure, you know, I would be at 21 inches of, and if I were lean a peak, not rich a peak, at 80 rich a peak, but if I were lean a peak at 50 to 100 lean a peak, I would be at 21 inches RPM because it's just a much more efficient way to operate your engine. Okay, and you know, if this is a reality expansion pack, that needs to be correct. That needs to be, you know, it needs to be, it needs to allow over square operations. And, you know, basically beyond some slightly over square at low power settings, it does not allow you to operate over square and it actually damages your engine. If you go into the maintenance report, when you're operating over square, it chews away at your, your compressions and I think probably your engine will eventually fail which is sad because, you know, I buy this to be as close to reality as possible and it appears either designers didn't understand the benefits of over square operation when you're lean a peak or just, you know, decided, oh, it's just too sophisticated for our user base to use. But, you know, if it's reality, let's get it to reality. So anyway, that's, that's my overview. Let, let's sum it up. So the things that are great about, that are not great about this airplane, there's a lot of little details that aren't correct. The, you know, there's the big over square issue. Uh, you know, it's got a lot of the car carryover Karen Auto things. Those are the bad things, but I think they're more than overweighed by the good things. You know, it teaches you a massive amount about how to fly a uh, fuel injected high performance engine correctly and, and how to understand Lena Peak and Richie Peak. It's great for that. Uh, the performance is very, very close to reality. I think the landing performance is very good. Uh, so generally, I would recommend it. I, I would think that, you know, if Rep went in there and fixed the issues that, that need to be fixed, that are, uh, you know, some of these things, like the Oversquare thing, that's, that's in their ballpark. They can fix that. If they fix that, that would be great. But, you know, if... But even, even without that stuff fact, fixed, this airplane is good. Now, I have the F-33A and you know, I don't have 250 hours in it, I have about 25 hours. And I'm probably gonna fly another 20, 30 hours and I'm gonna do a review of that. Uh, a lot of these issues are fixed in it. A lot of the issues are not. You know, the oversquare issue is still there. Uh, it actually says in the manual, it says, do not fly oversquare, which is ridiculous. And uh, there's a lot of little issues, some things that work correctly in this airplane that don't work correctly in that one. Uh, I think maybe if I were going to choose between the two, I would choose the F-33A if I were deciding which airplane to choose to, to install rep on. But, you know, it's pretty close. So, you know, I, I don't know if I would go out and buy the F-33A if, uh, if I owned the V-35B with the rep. So, anyway, I hope that's helpful. Uh, if you want reviews of any other airplanes, I'd be happy to do them. Uh, as, as I told you before, I, my intent here is to go very in depth and to talk about, you know, talk about the real world stuff and how, how close this is to reality and focus a lot less on the cosmetics and stuff. So I hope that helps you and please leave comments and try to make them positive. Thank you so much.